pray this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. As we uh, go to before the Lord this morning in prayer, just want to highlight our missionary of the month, which is um, the Quintesses, Deb and Ken, and uh, they're just asking for prayer for their sixth session, Sacred Mary's uh, Sacred Marriage class. Um, is that God would really speak there and, uh, and reach the 14 adults that they have? So think about them. Uh, just uh, pass out a prayer for them this week. So. This is um, the word of the Lord, Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. Let's uh, pray together as we well. Lord, you are amazing. And we do want to bless your name. Your name alone is the only name worthy of all honor and praise and glory. And Lord, we want to see that happen. We want to proclaim your wondrous deeds and proclaim your awesome character your steadfast love, your unshakable love. We're so thankful that you are slow to anger and gracious and merciful. We don't deserve that. But we're here under your grace. And we can pronounce, just like the psalmist did, that your mercy is over all that you've made. And we are so thankful. You are greatly to be praised. Your greatness is unsearchable. We look forward to the day where we get to spend eternity with you, learning more and more and more about your greatness and just proclaiming your praise in your presence someday. Lord, thank you that we can be here together as a body this morning, as a family, and we're thankful that we can uh, come and do just that now, we get a small taste of that now, that we can praise you right now. And Lord, we are just thankful, um, because there are times we don't want to do that, and we are tired, and we are broken, or sick, or just rebellious, and Lord, please forgive us for our sins, but we are grateful that we have the Lord Jesus, and that we can stand clean before you, and we can um, just declare your praise because of what he's done. We are thankful for that. Lord, we just, uh, as a family, want to come before you and just lift up our body. Lord, we want to lift up our missionaries. We are grateful for the Quintesses. They're just long hours that they put into the gospel, into these lives. And we are so thankful for their heart. And Lord, we just ask that you continue to provide for them, make them fruitful in their labors. And Lord, we do ask for this marriage class to just be really good and fruitful, and that you would really help these couples to taste your glory through this. And Lord, we um, just want to lift up some of our church members who are struggling with sickness, Lord, we are just broken bodies. <laughs> Lord, you are the great physician, and we just ask that you would have mercy on them. We ask that you would help Will and his heart to just heal. Lord, we ask that you would help Don and Larry as they face chemo and cancer. And Lord, we're, we just lift these up to you. And there's so many more that you know about and you care about, so please, Father, we ask your mercy. Sustain them as they bear this trial. Help them to be joyful in the midst of it, knowing that it's for their good if they're trusting you. Lord, we are thankful for the birth of our family. And we just ask that you would really comfort them as they mourn the loss of that. We ask that they would um, feel your presence. And we're thankful for the grace that you've had in this life. And uh, we are thankful um, that you do work, even through such circumstances. Father, we uh, are thankful that you've worked... Um, just to the doctors with Mary's dad, and that the surgery went well. And Lord, we're thankful for the, the youth kids that went on their retreat this weekend. And we just ask that it would just be a fruitful time as they wrap it up this morning. 
And Lord, uh, we are thankful for things like sports. We are grateful that you provide things like um, football, and that we can enjoy that. And Lord, we, we at the same time, we want to say we're sorry for the way our culture has idolized things like that. And Lord, we, we just want to lift up Hollywood to you this morning. Lord, you love those people. We ask that you forgive them and bring Christ to Hollywood. We want to see that. We want to see on our TV screens just your son being proclaimed and worshipped. We want to see people celebrating the gospel. So Lord, just help us today in our in our um, Super Bowl parties and just times together as families and um, just in our jobs and, and school, all of that, that you would just be glorified in everything we do. Just come and speak to your, your family this morning. Across the globe, feed your sheep, Father. Thank you for your word. You are great. And we just ask this through the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Well, welcome to Garnet E3 this morning. Glad you're here on this heat wave of a day, right? Good to see uh, some of the sidewalks again for the first time in the month. Um, uh, just real quick, if you are our visitor, we're really thankful you're here. Thanks for joining us today. And we just ask that you would um, tear off the little portion of your bulletin, fill it out. We'd love to just get to know you, see how we can be praying for you. You can just drop that in the offering uh, baskets as they go by. Um, several announcements this morning. Uh, first off, we have the uh, Winter VBS, the Yeehaw Winter VBS coming up. And uh, that's going to be Friday, February 28th, and then Saturday the 29th. So Friday night and Saturday. Uh, there's a link in your bulletins if you want to sign up to either have your kids come or uh, to help. We could definitely use some supplies. Um, also, for Awana, we are looking for some leaders. If you are um, uh, any good at games, or even if you're not any good at games, we, we could really use a game leader. Uh, it really doesn't take much. Uh, it's, it's pretty much you say go, and the kids like to run, so it's really fun. <laughs> uh, they are also looking for a kindergarten through second grade um, lesson leader. So if you're interested in either of those, the Lord's laying on your heart, you can contact Elizabeth Baxter. Also, Zion, the Red Roof Church in town, uh, they are hosting a Seeking Him conference. We had one here a couple couple weeks ago um, for the It's a Revive Our Hearts. Um, this one's going to be February 21st and 22nd. So um, if you're interested in that, it's $10, and there's a link in the bulletin that you can go to to sign up. Uh, also, it is that time of year where we have possible cancellations and weather, so if you are not on our texting notice alerts, um, you can just um, text, uh, well there's instructions there, uh, you can text that message to that number, <laughs> and um, we can make sure you're on that notification list, so, uh, let's see, also, God's Pantry is coming up, we are responsible uh, for the month of February, so, March. oh, for March, thank you, for March, so, you have a month now in advance, <laughs> uh, so if you have Mondays, uh, or Thursdays, uh, I believe it was Monday morning and Thursday afternoons. Um, we just love to have you come help. So Kelly took a few of the middle school girls over there. They, they just had a great time helping. So uh, just a fun time serving and um, dealing with some food and stuff. And that. So yeah. Um, there's a link in there if you want to sign up for that. And we usually have sheets on the back too if you want to sign up. And then a couple more things. Um, we have a membership class coming up. So if you're interested in joining the church family as a member, we'd love to uh, just tell you what that means and all that's entailed. So there's a class that will be February 22nd. Uh, you can just talk to Haddon or sign up on the back there. And then a few announcements that are not on the uh, um, slides this morning or in the bulletin. So uh, we are going to be showing the Super Bowl here. If you don't have Super Bowl plans yet, you can come tonight. Uh, just be here in the sanctuary and we'll just, uh, just kind of do that together as a family. Whether you're in uh, middle school, high school, or an adult, we'd love to have you. So, uh, just a few things for that. If you want to come, we just ask that you bring a, a snack to share, and uh, maybe a board game. For those of you who aren't super excited about the game and like to multitask or something like that, that's great. Um, and then, let's see, Five Loaves is asking for some help this Wednesday. Um, they just need some help organizing their clothes. So if you have some time Wednesday morning around 9.30, they'd love to have you just come to the Presbyterian Church and um, please help them organize for a little bit. Okay, Whew. that was a whole essay. I think we have one more. Todd's got one for the men's ministry, so Todd, you want to come on up? Yes, good morning. Good 
just wanted to talk about uh, some things coming up in men's ministry that we're really excited about. Um, next Sunday evening at 6 p.m. here at the church, uh, we're going to have a kickoff, and we're going at that time we're going to uh, kind of talk about some ideas that we have coming up for 2000 for 2020, I guess it is, and just um, just kind of want to fill people in on, on, on the events that we have planned, some studies that we have planned, and so forth. Or, and so come out uh, next Sunday evening at 6 p.m. for a time of uh, fellowship um, and to hear about, I guess, some high-level um, goals that we have. That this kind of these things will will tie into with the vision that was casted at the annual meeting uh, a few weeks ago and so forth. So we really want to uh, to to really help men to learn how to be, um, you know, look at look at look at the Bible and teach men to be. Um, as godly as they can be with the help of the Spirit to be leaders in their home uh, in this church family and in our communities and our jobs and so forth. And uh, the following week we'll start out our first study with a book written by Ken Harrison who is the CEO of Promise Keepers if you recall that organization that started quite a few years ago. And uh, he wrote a book called Rise of the Servant Kings. And so we'll, we'll do a study uh, on that using this as our uh, as a guide, but obviously the Bible is a benchmark. So um, come up for that. That'll probably be a, a relatively short um, time commitment. Most events that we're thinking of this year is to being you know events that last consecutive six, seven, eight, nine weeks, something like that. We're a more often more short snippets of, of, of time commitments. So so men, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of great ideas uh, that are floating around out there, and so um, we're super excited about it, and we'd love to have you come out next uh, next Sunday night and hear about it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. That wasn't Gotcha, I'm good. Okay, I got, Sorry. I got my time, time mixed around. Um, can I, let's call up um, Jared Akins and Pat Ennis and uh, Will Kessler, Pat Anderson, and Nathan Polly, please. <clears throat> so, the men behind us, me, are our elders for for 2020, and so we just wanted to have a time of uh, commissioning, if you will, uh, and just uh, really dedicate this time uh, and these leaders uh, for the spiritual, um, the spiritual calling that's been placed in your hearts. And that's a, that's a, that's a I'm, I'm going to read a text here out of First Peter, and it, this text comes with some encouragement and also comes with some direction. And I thought that was a kind of a nice little. Uh, opportunity to kind of look at that and, and, and see what that is. And then we're going to pray, and, um, and then we're going to, uh, yeah. So this is again from 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, starting in verse 1. It says, To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. Serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being <coughs> examples of the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. And so we as a, we as a church recognize that Christ is the head of the church. Um, and, uh, and, and we as a body um, uh, under that under that uh, submission. But we also have a biblical example here of, uh, of in this case, elders or pastors, shepherds, um, kind of means the same. And, and so that's what these men are doing. And so I really, um, I, I, I just, you know, there's, there's joy in this. And I, I pray, I'm going to pray that, that you will receive joy in serving this way. And so, congregation, we need, to, we need to support these guys and their families because it is a time commitment that does um, require some serious time. And uh, sometimes these things are easier, sometimes they're a little more challenging. But um, we're going to pray for wisdom, we're going to pray for um, faithfulness in that, 
and we just really are thankful that you, um, our gentlemen, have um, are willing to, to serve in this area. And so, um, yeah, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, and we are thankful uh, for this body of believers that you planted here in in um, Garner. Lord, we recognize that um, you established your church for a reason. And that reason is to bring light into a world that is dark, that Satan is trying to control and to divert and to, uh, and it's just, he's just, he's very strong. But Lord, we know that we have the upper hand because you, the battle belongs to you, the victory belongs to you, because you sent your son, Jesus. And Jesus, we recognize that you are the head of the church. We want all praise and glory to go to you. And Lord, we are just so thankful that, that we have that. Lord, as we pray for these men, Lord, we pray that, that they would um, serve and serve well. That you would strengthen them, that you would protect them, Lord. That the enemy might, is going to come after them in various forms. And Lord, would you just protect them so they are not discouraged. So that they have the perseverance to do the work that is sometimes difficult. But yet rewarding for it. Lord, this text that we, that we read at comes with both those, both those angles, Lord. And so, Lord, just uh, I pray for their, again, for the protection, that you would guard their hearts, that you would um, strengthen them, that we as a body would encourage them. Lord, also be with their families, as this is a time commitment that requires time away from the whole. So, Lord, um, um, we are so blessed in how you raise up leaders, and we are blessed in the, the fact that we have these gentlemen that are willing to serve this way. Lord, I also want to lift up all ministry leaders, whether it's elected position or otherwise, um, serving in, in a position that uh, uh, is bringing honor to you, Lord. That is the goal. And so thank you for all the leadership within this body. Um, protect us all. Be with us. And thank you, King Jesus, for being our Savior and coming to this world. It's in your name we pray. Let's uh, take a moment to stand and greet one another, and then we'll sing this one.
Dave. We will continue worshiping through the giving of our tithes and offerings. And as we do, if you are a worker in the back with the children and you'd like to come and take communion right now, we invite you to come forward to do that. Children can be dismissed. Uh, I believe this week it's first through third graders. As well as, as, well as okay, as well as uh, what you say? Okay. As well as preschool. As well as preschool. Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, for some reason that just does not stick in my mind. But you kids can edit it out. Uh, and let's all stand together as we uh, hear the word of the Lord. Um, and first let's read our uh, final verse together, which is Psalm 121, uh, verses 5 and 6. Let's read this together. The Lord, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. And the word, uh, our sermon text this morning is 1 Corinthians 12. It's going to be 12 um, through 26. Hear the word of the Lord. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our, um, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, given greater honor to the part that, it, that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. You may be seated. Let's go to the, let's go to the Lord in prayer one more time, and then we'll look into His Word together. Father, thank you for bringing us into, into the body of Christ, and thank you for giving us one another. Lord, what an amazing thing is. That we don't have to live this Christian life on our own, but that we get to walk the road to heaven together. And so, Lord, I pray that as we look at your word now, that you would teach us about what it means to walk with you together, and that you would help us 
as a church to grow, to, to love one another more and more, and to help one another, and to serve one another, and to live in such a way that we would bring glory to you together through our unity as the body of Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. In 1 Corinthians 13, just the very next chapter, Paul wrote these famous words. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Now that is really... A good description of the way that Jesus loves us, isn't it? And those words in 1 Corinthians 13 also give us direction for how we should love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Now last Sunday morning we began a short series, a five-week series on God's calling to the church. And in Matthew 12 last Sunday we saw that Jesus teaches us that the church is a family. We are Jesus' own brothers and sisters and that means that we are brothers and sisters of one another. And as members of Jesus' family, we're called to love one another as family. This morning we're going to spend time in 1 Corinthians 12, where Paul points out that the church is not only the family of Christ, it's also the body of Christ. And as members of Christ's body, what are we called to do? We're called to love one another. And this passage, ultimately, is going to teach us about how we can love one another as members of Christ's body. So let me just begin by pointing out the context here in 1 Corinthians. Chapters 12 through 14 of this letter really focus in on spiritual gifts in the church. Verse 1 of chapter 12 says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. And so in the first 11 verses of chapter 11, Paul is making the point that there's a wide variety of gifts in the church. Different people in the church family have very different gifts, very different <coughs> abilities that God has gifted us with. And the great diversity that we have in the church shouldn't lead to division, but it should lead to unity. Verse 7 tells us the reason that God gives specific gifts to each Christian. It says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit, for the common good. God gives each one of us different spiritual gifts for the common good. And so, God creates Christians to be different from one another, to have different spiritual gifts. And we're meant to work together in unity with all the diversity for the good of the whole church. And that's really Paul's theme throughout these whole three chapters. We're meant together to work. To, we're, we're meant to work together in unity, in love, like we see in chapter thirteen, to build up the entire church. In fact, towards the end of this discussion in chapter fourteen, Paul says it this way: When you gather together as the church, let all things be done for building up. And so that's what Paul is teaching us here in First Corinthians twelve to fourteen, and our passage that we're going to focus in now this focus in on now this morning really fits right into that teaching on the unity of the church and how important it is for us to build up one another in love. And so here's the basic principle of this morning's passage. Here's the, here's the basic truth that Paul is going to teach and unpack for us here. The Holy Spirit has brought each one of us as believers into the one body of Christ. And this body is like a human body. It's one body with many different members that work together in unity. That's a basic truth that Paul wants us to learn that he's going to unpack for us. And so here's how he says it in verses 12 and 13. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Now, I want you to notice in these first couple of verses in our text that it's because of the gospel that we are members of the body of Christ. When you are born again, the Holy Spirit comes into your life and He joins you to Christ. He gives you a, a marriage-like union 
with Christ. That's why Paul could say in, in several of his other letters that we've died with Christ. We've been raised with Christ. We belong to Christ. Those things are true because the Holy Spirit has joined us to Jesus Christ. And so if you've been joined to Christ, then you know what that means? It means that you're part of His body. <laughs> Christ is the head of the body, and all of us who have been joined to Him by the Holy Spirit are the parts of His body. We are members of His body, which of course is the church. And so everything that Paul teaches us in this passage is grounded ultimately in the gospel. The gospel tells us that Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the dead so that our sins could be forgiven and so we could have eternal life. And the gospel also tells us that because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, we belong to the body of Christ. And the Holy Spirit is living in us to help us to serve the rest of the body. So with that in mind now, let's start looking at the next few verses. Verse 14 says, For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. So just think of your own body. You have over 200 bones, about 700 different muscles, you have many different organs, 10 fingers, 10 toes. Each one of these things is different, and each one has an important role to play in your body. And in verses 15 and 16, Paul writes, If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. So just imagine for a moment, if your foot said, I wish I was a hand. The hand has a really important job. I'm just a dirty old foot. I'm worthless. And imagine if your foot actually got its wish. And so you had three hands and one foot. Or if both of your feet actually wanted to be hands, and so you ended up with four hands and no feet. <laughs> you might be really good at washing dishes, but you know what? You're not going to be able to get around at all without any feet. Or imagine if your ears said, well, we're no good because we're not eyes. And imagine then if you ended up with your ears getting their wish, and they became eyes, and you had four eyes and no ears. You'd be able to see really well, but you would be deaf. In verse 17, it stretches the, the, the picture even further. It says, if the whole body were an eye, I mean, it, it, almost like a, like, a, like a monster, just a gigantic eye. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? Or if the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? <laughs> the point that Paul is making here is clear, isn't it? <laughs> each member of the human body, your body, my body, each member of our bodies has unique abilities unique functions that are designed by God for the good of the body. And in the same way, each member of the body of Christ has unique abilities that are designed by God for the good of the whole body. This is not an accident. Paul is very clear that God is the one who gave each one of us our unique abilities and our unique gifts. God is the one who brought us together into the one body. Verses 18 through 20. But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as He chose. Not as we chose, but as He chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. And so that leads to the practical question, how has God uniquely designed you to serve the body of Christ? How has God uniquely created you and gifted you what are the unique contributions that you bring to this body of believers here at Carnegie Evangelical Free Church? Let me encourage you this morning. You are valuable. Every one of you here is incredibly valuable. Your gifts are useful to the body. You know, there are some Christians, maybe even some here today, that think, I don't have anything useful to offer to the church. There's nothing I can really do to serve very well. If there is something I can do, it's, it's really not very important. But it's really like, exactly like the foot just saying, well, I'm not a hand, so I don't matter, I'm not important. No, God made you exactly the way that you are with your particular gifts, and He did it for the good of the body of Christ. God did not make a mistake when He made you the way that you are. He did not create you to be useless. God doesn't do that. 
God doesn't create us to be useless. He doesn't make a mistake in the way that He makes each one of us. He made you exactly the way He wants you to be. And so I want to encourage you this morning that you can put your gifts to use and you can serve in the body of Christ trusting that God is going to use you to make a difference. Our responsibility is to be faithful. Our responsibility is to serve in the specific ways God has equipped us, equipped us to serve. It's not our job to measure the impact. That's up to God to measure the impact. And so if God has gifted you to be a Sunday school teacher or a worship leader or a nursery volunteer or an Awana helper or to make meals for the sick or to be a prayer warrior or anything else, be faithful in using your gifts. You can trust that God is going to use your service for His glory and to build up the church. It's like Paul says at the end of chapter 15 here in 1 Corinthians, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, be movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Now, before we move on from here, into, into the rest of the passage, I, I want to point out that verses 14 through 20 really help us to understand what church membership is all about. This text, verses 14 through 20, uses the word uh, member several times. It, it continues to be used in the rest of the passage. And of course, Paul is talking about the members of the human body, our, our, our hands, our feet, our eyes, our ears. And Paul is also talking about the members of the body of Christ. C.S. Lewis who wrote the Chronicles of Narnia and, and, and many other wonderful Christian books, uh, he wrote an essay that points out that the way that we use the word membership today is almost the opposite of what Paul meant when he talked about membership in the body of Christ. In our context, for example, here in Garner in, in the year 2020, you can be a member of the Country Club, you can be a member of the Rotary Club, you can be a member of Sam's Club, you can go shopping there, in each one of those examples, your name would be one of many names on a membership list. And each member of any one of those organizations, or many more, each member has the same privileges. You can play golf at the country club. You can go shopping at Sam's Club. And this modern idea of sameness, uh, this, excuse me, this modern idea of membership emphasizes sameness. That every member of the organization has the same privileges. Every member counts as one unit on the list of members. And C.S. Lewis points out that when Paul used the word members, he was not emphasizing how they're the same. He was not emphasizing that each person counts as one unit on the list. Instead, Paul was emphasizing how the members of the body are actually different from one another. How each member of the body is unique. Think of the members of the body that are mentioned in these verses. Paul talks about the hand, the foot, the eye, the ear. These things are all very different from one another. Your ear is incredibly different from your foot. All the parts of our body are unique, but they all work together for the good of the whole body. And so, when you think about being a member of the church, don't think that means primarily that I'm just one of 100 people or so on the membership list. Just like being the members of the country club or members of the Rotary Club. Instead, you should think, I'm a member of the body designed by God with unique abilities, unique gifts, unique ways that I can serve the rest of the body. God made me this way for the good of the, of the church. In other words, membership is not mainly about having your name on a list. Membership is mainly about servanthood. That's what it's all about. When you think of yourself as a member of a church, don't think, first of all, my name is on the list at Garner Evangelical Free Church. Think, God has designed me in unique ways to serve at Garner Evangelical Free Church. Now, let me just say, for those here who are not officially members, of this church, let, let me just say that becoming a member is really just a public way of saying, I'm part of the body. I'm, a, I'm an eye, or I'm a hand, or a foot, or an ear, or a knee, or an arm, or a nose. I'm going to use the gifts God has given me to build up this church. 
And so becoming a member is not simply saying, well, you can count me on the membership rolls, or I get to vote at the congregation meetings. Those things are true, but that's not what it's mainly about. Becoming a member is a way of publicly committing to serving the Lord by serving His church. Now, this is not to say that you can't serve in the church without officially becoming a member. Regular attenders are welcome to serve here. But if you are a regular attender and you're regularly serving, then really you're already functioning in many ways as a member of the body. And so why not go ahead and just officially and publicly become a member? So that's why we're having membership class on February 22nd. So, with that in mind now about what it really means to be a member of the body, let's move ahead to the rest of the passage. So verses 14 through 20, this is how we should think of ourselves as members of the body of Christ. Now in the rest of the passage, Paul wants to teach us how we should think about others as members of the body of Christ. So, starting in verse 21, Paul says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. So we can stop right there for a moment. If we ever think to ourselves, well, that person over there isn't really important, he's not very gifted. She doesn't really do anything useful in the church. <laughs> that is not a godly attitude. That is not biblical at all. The person in the church that you think is weak, that has a job that just seems unimportant, is actually indispensable, according to what Paul tells us here. So I remember one Sunday morning when I was in high school, and... About one minute before the worship service started, the worship leader came up to me and he said, Hey, will you run the overhead projector today? Now, remember when we all used uh, overhead projectors in church? <laughs> we had this little machine you'd turn on, and then there would be someone who would, um, you know, take the slides with overhead transparencies. They, they'd put, you know, every, every, every new song, they'd put the slide on, and, and for verse 2, they'd move it down, and then move back up to the chorus. <laughs> If it was a really long song, they might need to get the second slide and put it on there, then flip back to the chorus on the first slide. So, evidently, the, the person that, that did that, this, uh, typically in my church, was not there this particular Sunday. So I got recruited at 829 um, to help with uh, doing that at 830. <laughs> and when it came to be time to sing, I went up to the front, and I wanted to turn on the projector, and I could not find the on-off switch. I, re I looked around the whole machine for I don't know how long, it seemed like eternity, and I could not find the button to turn the thing on. <laughs> Everyone in the church was looking at me. I'm sure they were all thinking, here's this kid who's on the A honor roll and he can't turn on the projector. <laughs> and so finally, the worship leader put down his guitar and he came up and he turned it on and he put an end to my awkward teenage moment, thankfully. It would be easy to think the person who runs the overhead projector isn't very important. The people on the worship team, they're important. The Sunday school teachers, they're important. But the person that changes the slides? I mean, that's an easy job. All you need to know how to be able to do is to read. So you can change slides and, well, I guess you'd have to be able to turn it on. So that's easy to do. But you know what? The one Sunday morning that that person was gone and I filled in, the whole worship service was held up because the substitute was incompetent. <laughs> the congregation could not lift our voices in praise to God together until the worship leader came up and turned on the machine for me. My embarrassing experience as a teenager demonstrates every single member of the body of Christ is important. There are no insignificant people. There are no insignificant ministries. And so, when you see people using their gifts to serve the body, encourage them that what they're doing matters. Even if it's, if it's something that seems small or behind the scenes or, or easy, encourage them that what they're doing matters. As verse 22 says, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Now, we might ask, why would God put the body together this way? 
Why is each member of the body so vitally important? Well, look at the rest of verse 24 through verse 26. God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. Why? So that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. And so if any church ever thinks these people are important, and these other people in the church are not important, they don't really matter. Their gifts, their ministries are not important. That's going to lead to what? It's going to lead to division in the body, not unity. It's going to lead to church members who really don't care very much about one another. But when we realize that God himself has knit us together in such a way that every person matters, that God has even given greater honor to the part that lacked it, then you know what we're going to do? We really will care for one another. We really will love one another. And we can serve for one another. When one person in the church is suffering, then we all suffer together with that one person. When one person in the church is rejoicing, then we all rejoice together. Really, that's how the human body works, isn't it? When my stomach got the flu, a week and a half ago or so, my whole body was suffering. And then when my stomach was healed, my whole body was rejoicing. And this is how it works in the family, too, isn't it? In last week's sermon text, Jesus taught us that the church is a family, that the church is his family. And when one member of your family is part of the team that wins the state championship, what happens? The whole family rejoices together. You all celebrate together. And when one member of your family is suffering in the hospital, what happens? The whole family suffers. Everyone is concerned. If it's serious enough, everyone comes. They all come to the hospital. Over the last few weeks, I got to meet a lot of members of Ed Burkhardt's family in the hospital. When someone in the family has a heart attack, you don't need to call up the kids and say, okay, dad's in the hospital with a heart attack, and so what, what you're supposed to do now is come to the hospital. That, that, that's the right thing to do now. No, you just tell them dad's had a heart attack, and they come. They just know that this is what they need to do. And that's the way it works in a family, and that's the way it should work in the family of God. When one member is suffering, we're so filled with love, care, concern for one another, that we suffer together, that we help one another. Romans 12, 15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. And so let me ask you, is this an area that you need to grow in? Do you need to ask God to help you have a deeper love for your brothers and sisters in Christ so that you truly care for them, so that you suffer with them when they're suffering, so you rejoice with them when they're rejoicing. As I mentioned earlier, in the next chapter here in 1 Corinthians, Paul is going to launch into his famous discussion about love. I'm sure that you've heard 1 Corinthians 13 read at a lot of weddings, and that's very appropriate. I've preached more than one sermon at a wedding from 1 Corinthians 13. But 1 Corinthians 13 applies first and foremost to the church. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast, so forth. This is how we are supposed to love one another as members of the body of Christ. And if we have this kind of deep, Christ-like, sacrificial love for one another, then we will care for one another. We will suffer with those who are suffering and rejoice with those who are rejoicing. If we have 1 Corinthians 13 love for one another, then we won't look down on anybody that we think has less important gifts, but instead we'll appreciate that. If we have 1 Corinthians love, 13 love for one another, then we'll be eager to use the gifts we've been given to serve in the body. And so really, this, this is the motivator. This is the real motivator for serving in the church. We serve not because it's just our <coughs> obligation, because somebody has to do it, because this program isn't going to run if we don't have enough volunteers. No, we serve because we love one another. And when you love the members of your family, and that really is what we are, we are a family, then it's actually a joy to serve. It's not an obligation or a duty, it's a joy. And so, we work through the whole passage now, and, and, and I just want to take a moment before we close to go back and point out that there's a theme that Paul keeps coming back to you again and again throughout this passage. 
Did you notice what it is? It's the theme of unity. That there is one body that's meant to be united. I want you to look again at verse 12, beginning of this passage. It says about halfway through the verse that all the members of the body, though many, are one body. And then verse 13 says, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. If you skip down to verse 20, it says, As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. <laughs> verse 25, God has so composed the body. Why? In such a way that there may be no division in the body. In other words, that there would be unity in the body. Paul is really serious about this, isn't he? God is serious about this. We have a responsibility to maintain unity in the church and to avoid doing anything that would cause division. And so what does that mean for us practically? How do we do this? It means we need to avoid doing things like gossiping about one another, talking behind someone's back. We need to avoid harboring grudges against one another, undermining leadership, grumbling and complaining like the Israelites in the wilderness. Remember how they were always murmuring and murmuring? We need to avoid doing that. And instead we need to promote unity. And there are, there are countless ways we can promote unity. And really, I think it's a joy to promote the unity of the church. And so, when we meet together here, and when we meet together informally, or outside of the church, in small groups, wherever it might be, let's do things like encourage one another, and build up one another, and thank people for using their gifts, and encourage one another, and ask people how you can pray for them, and then do it right there, pray for them right on the spot. Love people that are hard for you to love. Love people that are different from you. Love people that seem difficult to get along with. And encourage one another. And did I say it? Encourage one another. <laughs> and as we do that, what should we expect? In fact, as we apply this whole passage, and every member of the body uses their gifts to serve the body, and we appreciate one another, and we care for one another, what should we expect to happen as a result? We should expect that the, that the body of Christ is going to be built up. We should expect that there will be fruit, there will be growth, the body of Christ will be healthy and be growing. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16 says this, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Did you hear that? When each part is working properly, then the result is that the body builds itself up in love. That's the way that Christ himself works through each member of the body to build up the whole body. And so be encouraged, brothers and sisters. Everything that you do to serve in the body of Christ matters. Every time that you teach Sunday school or encourage someone, or pray with somebody, or serve in the nursery, or, or whatever it might be. Christ himself is working through you to build up the church. And you can expect that as each one of us plays our part in the body of Christ, you will be built up. All of us together will be built up. And Christ will be glorified in us and through us. Let's pray together. Lord, we're so thankful that, <laughs> that you love each one of us, and that you have a role for us to play here in this community of faith, in this family. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would strengthen us to serve you faithfully, that we might appreciate one another, that we would care for one another more and more. Lord, thank you for this, th thank you for this body of believers and for the love that you have put in our hearts here. And I just pray that our love might abound more and more and that you would be glorified as we work together in unity to glorify your name. May this body continue to be built up through the gospel, and through everyone's gifts to work together. For your glory's sake, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we go to the Lord's table now, I just want to flip back one page in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In verses 16 and 17, Paul writes these words. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, 
We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So Paul's telling us there that the Lord's Supper is a public demonstration of the unity that we have as the body of Christ. That's one of the things that the Lord's Supper does. It publicly shows the unity that we have. There's one bread that we share together, and that bread represents the body of Jesus himself that was offered for us on the cross. There's one cup that we share together, and that cup represents the blood of Jesus that was poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. And so, as we come to the Lord's table, we can do so knowing that what really binds us together, ultimately, is Jesus himself. It's the gospel that unifies us. We are one body in Christ because Jesus gave his body and he shed his blood so that we could belong to him and so that we could belong to one another as brothers and sisters and members of the same body. If you know Christ as your Savior, if you're trusting in Him for the forgiveness of your sins, then you're welcome to enjoy this meal with us. You don't have to be an official member of this particular body to enjoy this meal. You just need to be one who knows Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you don't know Christ this morning, we ask that out of respect you would let the elements go by, or that even better, that even in this moment, you would turn to Christ in repentance and repentance and receive His gift of everlasting life. Right now, let's just take a moment to quiet our hearts and to prepare that to be wrong. Receive the Lord's Supper as the elders come forward. Father, as we come to you again today, we just want to be mindful of what your Son has done for us, taking this to our minds and hearts and using it every day to share with others in everything that we do. Because just like the ear or the eye, like Adam talked about this morning, all are important. Each of us here have a job to do. So Lord, give us the strength to do it this week. And we thank you for your Son and his body.
Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. What would you think the Lord would think for us? Dear precious Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, and we thank you. We thank you for sending your Son. We thank you for the love that he had for us. He went to Calvary's cross and shed his precious holy blood. We thank you for the gift of salvation and eternal life because of that great love. So guide us and direct us and help us to keep our eyes focused on you and your love for us. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. same way also, Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. Let's pray together once more. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful for your body that you gave up for us and the blood that you spilled on Calvary for us so that we could be saved. What a, what a wonderful thing to know that we belong to you, now and forever, because of your grace and your love for us. And so I pray that your love would flood our hearts and that we would live out that love in the way that we treat one another, in the, in the way that we treat the whole world, Lord. That you would just pour out your love through us, through each one of us, Lord. Thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. And we pray this all in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. As we close, let's stand for, for God's blessing from his word. We just mentioned that if you're able to stick around to help pick up chairs for Alana, we'd appreciate that. But we're going to leave the first few rows for the um, Super Bowl party tonight. And if you'd like to pray with someone this morning, there will be a prayer team available here at the front. And they'd love to spend some time with you. And so the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.